father was born in 1936 in a village called Al Shajara in northern Galilee in Palestine. Uh, my father stayed there till about he was 10, 12 years old when the state of Israel was established and he was forced to leave his village. He and his family moved to a camp called Ain al Hilwi in the outskirts of a city called Sidon in southern Lebanon. He lived there, he went to school for a number of years, uh, but he could not continue for financial conditions. He learned to be a mechanic, and then he went to Saudi Arabia well, for two years. But he felt that this is not his calling. He went back to Lebanon, he tried to study art for a while, teach art in an art school, and in 1964, he got an offer to go to Kuwait to work for a magazine called at -Talia. I met him in, in, uh, in Kuwait in 1983 when I had a one-man show there. For me, it was like as if I know him a long time ago. ago. He's too, too friendly with everyone, actually. But at the same time, he was very harsh when he wanted to criticize somebody. Naji was a, a great uh, name as a, a political cartoonist, you know. He was uh, adored by uh, the Palestinian people and the Arab uh, peoples in general. You uh, couldn't imagine that a person with this popularity and uh, this big name could uh, really be so, so uh, simple and humble. He loved uh, people and loved to talk to people. Naji al-Ali was the most phenomenal artist and political thinker, I would say, to cover the daily drama of the Palestinian tragedy. So all of these stories of this great epic where we have these leaders that sell us out or, uh, you know, any of the many, many things that would happen every week to us, Naji al-Ali would explain it and give it a principle and heart. The Nakba or the catastrophe was imprinted on my father. He could never forget what happened to them, the experience of having to leave your land, your house, your village, your community, and suddenly be stranded in a different country, in a tent, no job, no money, no land, that left its scar on my father and his generation. Alhamdul in Arabic is a very bitter fruit. It's something, if, you know, something that you cannot stand. So when you have a better life and you stand it, so you are strong. It's a symbol of strength. Hanzala is a 10-year-old child. He never grew. Time stopped for Hanzala when he left Palestine. Hanzala is poor. Hanzala is not good looking. His hair is spiky, not combed. His clothes are basically torn. He's barefooted. Most of the time, Hanzala is not looking at you in the face. He turns his back to you. He's looking to Palestine. He's looking back home, the home that he would like to go back. Hansa represents the conscience of my father. A child is always innocent. A child will always speak his or her mind. Do not think of the consequences. They're innocent. So Hansa is the conscience that is the compass which tells my father that's the right way.
the Palestinian refugees, they literally escaped the war. They closed their doors, their homes. They took the keys and they thought that they are coming back very soon. You see this cartoon where the keys, it's like washing outside the house, you know. It's, this, is the, how, how, this is the Palestinian reality. Everybody is waiting to use his, his key later on, you know. So Naji was one of those people who escaped. He was a child. He escaped with his family and they were put in a refugee camp. They lived in poverty and uh, in need of everything, really. This made Naji Al Ali uh, to revolt or to, to become a rebel against, against this situation. My father's drawings show in the clearest manner, in the most explicit manner, in his unequivocal love for Palestine. Palestine for him was not the West Bank, Gaza, or parts of Palestine. Palestine was the whole of Palestine, historic Palestine. In many of his cartoons, he never lost focus at all, the fact that he wants to go back home. The most important thing Naji Al Ali did for us, because it wasn't just Palestinians that were reading him, the Arab leaders were reading him, the Egyptian people, the Jordanian people, the Syrian people, the people in the Gulf, was to elevate and make visible who was um, helping us and who was not. He drew many cartoons about the oil, the role of the oil in the politics in the Middle East, the fact that the Western powers are much interested in the region because of the oil, and that in a way the oil is much more like a curse than a benefit for the peoples of the region. You could see it here in this uh, uh, the cartoon. Not only the U.S., it is the British and the French as well. Both, you know, all three, you know, they are standing. On, on barrels of oil. And uh, here, the, <laughs> it's very symbolic, this, uh, the barrel of, of oil which uh, is, is leaking and it is like a hand which, which shows it is to the direction of the USA. Here, the drums, they, it, it is about the war drums and the newspaper is saying the war drums, and what is the war drums? It's oil drums. <laughs> he got a lot of work which he criticized the USA in a sense, because he, for him, it's USA really the main, I mean, 100% behind Israel. It is very complicated uh, case of the, for the relation between politician, Arab politician, Palestinian with America is very complicated one. And and this, this is not, this is give you a little bit of the complication of this, but here, for example, he tried to say that everyone tried to go to the White House, but they don't know what, which key the best to open this door to them and go and be very much uh, close to the politician in the White House. You have this cartoon that it shows that the Arab regimes, all of them, they, their mouths are uh, shut by a U.S. <laughs> it is open and shut by the U.S. It's a fantastic one. For him, it was the most difficult part. I, I think it's his... Uh, Disappointment with what happened with the uh, struggle, 
in particular, uh, some of the well-known names in the PLO, for example, he found himself uh, in a way witness to a very corrupt a group of people who tried to use the Palestinian case for their benefit. All these put him in, in a position which uh, he cannot be quiet. Mobilizing people in the Arab world is a very dangerous thing. That's why they wanted to stop him. So they put pressure, the Kuwaitis uh, put pressure on the owner of the newspaper to stop Naji. So they moved him to London. He used to leave in the afternoon to the newspaper in Chelsea to fax his drawings then to the newspaper back in Kuwait. On the 22nd of July, he headed to work as normal. Uh, he parked his car and he was heading towards the newspaper. A, a man approached him from his back, from, uh, approached him and shot him once from the back. Uh, my father fell, the assassin ran away, and on 29th of August, he passed away. This, is, this shows you how much for intellectual when he became outsider. When you are outsider, then you have to pay for it. And unfortunately, he paid for it in his life. His legacy is the importance of that role. Always speaking truth to power, always serving a popular struggle and ordinary people. So this made him beloved by Palestinians. So honest, so clear-eyed, and uh, which for us, of course, was a relief that someone could portray exactly what was going on, how absurd our predicament was. They tried to scare him off. They tried to then to basically banish him somewhere else. Yeah. This did not stop him, did not scare him off. They thought this is the only way they could silence him. They were wrong in a way, because as he predicted, his, he has passed away 30 years ago, but his works do live till now.